In my never-ending quest to expand your mind, today we are going to go to higher dimensions. What do I mean? Well, let's look at this. I have a graph and it has vertices and edges and it's natural to think about the vertices as being zero-dimensional things and the edges as being one-dimensional things. And we saw that with the introduction of simplicial complexes, we were comfortable talking about triangles also. And those are clearly two-dimensional, and I can have tetrahedra, maybe three-dimensional, and I can just keep going. They don't always have such nice names in higher dimensions. These are all simplices. And we talk about the dimension of a simplex and a simplicial complex, well, it's just the size minus one. So it's the size of the simplex minus one. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what about the empty simplex? The dimension of the empty simplex, which has size zero, is negative one. Now, some of you may have spent some time trying to imagine the fourth dimension and that was pretty cool, but I wonder how many of you spent any time trying to think about what it would be like to be in a negative one-th dimension. Negative first dimension? Dimension negative one? We should take a little poll to find out what we should call this dimension. But it's handy to have as a simplex, and so we continue the definition, and so that's like the negative one-dimensional object. Deal with it. All right. If G is a graph, the clique complex of G is going to be a simplicial complex where I just take the vertices of the graph and the simplices are just the cliques in the graph. Specifically, what I mean is the subset of vertices such that the induced subgraph is a clique. So that is, it's the set of all sigma subset of VG such that the induced subgraph on that set of vertices is complete. It has all the vertices. And I guess we, in order to keep this as a simplicial complex, we're going to allow for a, a graph K0, a complete graph on zero vertices, which is empty. Um, but that's just a technicality. Don't worry about that. Um, and the rule, of course, to be a simplicial complex it has two parts. First is that the simplices have to be subsets of vertices. Well, that's in the definition. Every simplex is a subset of vertices. Good. Second condition is that the simplex set has to be closed under taking subsets. That is, if I take any simplex and I take a subset of that simplex, it should also be a simplex. And in this case, that's not hard to check. Right? So if g of tau is complete, that is, the induced subgraph on some vertex set tau, then uh, g of sigma is also complete, and that's going to be true for all sigma subset of tau, okay, because every pair of vertices in tau has an edge between it, and sigma is just a subset of tau, so every pair of vertices in sigma has an edge between it. All right, so we can construct this simplicial complex from a graph. If we happen to have uh, a simplicial map between, again, this is the simplicial complex associated with G and H. You can really, if you like, may even be better for us to think of this as just a simplicial map from G to H. Then I can write the clique complex map. That is, this is going to be a simplicial map induced by F between the clique complexes. So this is the clique complex of G and the clique complex of H. And notice that this is a different operation than just thinking of the graph as a simplicial complex because we've added higher dimensional simplices. We added triangles every time there was a K3 subgraph. We added tetrahedra for every K4 subgraph, and etc. So every clique in this graph G is going to give us a simplex. And I can define this map between the clique complexes that comes from 
the map on the graphs. And it's, again, perhaps the most straightforward thing to do, which is to do the same thing on the vertices. So this simplicial map G is going to map the vertices exactly the same as the way F did. And the map on the simplices is going to be the only possible choice once you've fixed the map on the vertices. So it's going to map each simplex sigma to the set of all GV of u for u and sigma. It just maps all the vertices according to GV. And the only tricky thing here is for us to actually show that this pair of functions is a simplicial map. Right? A simplicial map is a pair of functions that has a certain relationship. In this case, actually, maybe that's the easy part. What do we need to show? We need to show that uh, this really is a function. We know it's a, a function from simplices to something, but we need to check that this thing right here is actually in the simplex set of clique of H. So really we want to show that this thing is a clique. Does it fit? Clique in H. Pretend I wrote the rest of the word there. There we go. So let's check. If, I might need the small pen if, to fit this in. If sigma is a simplex, is, let's just write is a clique in G, then it means that every pair of vertices in sigma is an edge. So for all u, w, and sigma, we have u, w is in the edge set of G. And I guess I left a little space here because we do need to check. I mean, um, u is not equal to w. So distinct vertices in sigma all have an edge between them. That's what it means to be a clique. So that means we can say that for all g, v of u, g, v of w, in, this is g, s of sigma. So if I took this sigma and I look at the image of sigma under g, s, I know that it's going to contain both of these. They might be the same, but if it happens to be that they're different, g, v of u is not equal to g, v of w, then we know that this pair, which is as size 2 now, because they're different, which is, again, is now equal to g, s of u, w, by definition, must actually be an edge in the original graph. So every pair of vertices that form an edge in that simplex is going to map to an edge. Therefore, the image of just that edge is an edge. And therefore, since every pair is connected, it means that the whole thing, g, s of sigma, is a clique. This was all to just check that g, s had the right type, that g, s really is a function from the simplices of clique G to the simplices of clique H. Okay, so we have a construction. We can take a graph and we can construct the simplicial complex from it just by thinking of vertices and edges, but now we have a new way of doing it, a new way of getting a simplicial complex, which is called the clique complex. And this clique complex has um, a pretty straightforward notion of, of how to get a simplicial map from a graph homomorphism or even from a simplicial map. So the simplicial map on the clique complex is if I look at the composition of these maps, I'm going to get just 
clique of F composed with clique of G. So in the way it looks like this operation of taking a function and mapping it to a simplicial map or taking a graph homomorphism and mapping it to a simplicial map on the clique complexes, it behaves nicely with respect to composition. It also does the right thing with identity. That is, if I took the clique complex on A and I took its identity simplicial map, I would get that from the identity graph homomorphism. And this is just another chance to point out the importance of looking at composition and identity. From these two, when you have this kind of operation where you go from one kind of thing, in this case a graph, to another kind of thing, a simplicial complex, and the graph homomorphisms map to simplicial maps in a nice way, one thing that comes out immediately is that if the graphs were isomorphic, then it immediately implies that the clique complexes are also isomorphic. So on the left-hand side, this is isomorphism of graphs, and on the right-hand side, this is isomorphism of simplicial complexes. Here's a cool example. This is a real example, and I've simplified it as much as possible while keeping it true. So the, this theory called homological sensor networks, I put sensor in these scare quotes here um, because it is a real idealized notion of what a sensor network would be. And in this case, I've got a graph. Let's start with the graph where the vertex set, I've called it B here. These are these boxes. Every box is a vertex. And let's keep the boxes aligned with the axes so they have horizontal and vertical edges. And I'm going to add an edge between two boxes if they have an intersect, an intersection. So there's an edge for each overlap of two boxes. And a question you might ask is, well, do I have any holes in the coverage? In this case, a hole might be something like this. You'll notice that there's a region that's not covered by any box. Here's another one, a little weirder one. There's a region that's not covered by any box, but it is surrounded. If I were to draw the graph G on top of this, uh, what would we see? We have vertices for every box. And we'd have edges for boxes that overlap. So I haven't done the whole thing, but you'll notice already that it seems that there are some interesting cycles that correspond to the holes. But it would be wrong to think that every cycle is a hole because you'll notice up here that there are cycles that do not bound holes. If I were to instead look at the clique complex though, you'll notice that these cycles that don't bound holes seem to be made up of triangles. So if I look at the clique complex of this graph, the cycles, which are not in some sense sums of triangles, are exactly the holes. And I'm gonna write this out here. So holes are identified with, there's in one-to-one -one correspondence with cycles that are not and I'm going to, again, put some scare quotes, although this can be made, actually quite easily made, into something that is rigorous. I'm going to call it a sum of triangles. The sum here is really just going to be, uh, is going to be symmetric difference of sets of edges. So if I think of a triangle as three edges and I take symmetric differences that if I get the edge set of a cycle, for instance, this cycle here, let me draw it really dark, going around is the sum of these four triangles. And although that's a cycle, it's not a triangle, it's not a, in the simplicial complex as a simplex, it is a sum of triangles and so it's not a whole. And so um, 
the holes we have, they, it is surrounded by a cycle, but really you have to be careful, of course, because not every cycle bounds a hole. This does mean that you could take just the graph as just the combinatorial information and determine whether there are holes in here without actually doing anything geometric. It looks like this is a really geometric process of trying to find points that are surrounded but not covered, but you can do it just from the graph. And um, like I said, this is maybe the simplest version of this. Uh, but you'll see this show up a lot in an area of math called topological data analysis. Let's do one more simplicial complex from a graph. That's a different kind of simplicial complex construction. And what it will be is the following. I'm going to call it the independence complex. So I have the graph. It has a vertex set. And the independence complex will have a simplex for every independent set. In other words, if I took the induced subgraph on some subset of vertices, hopefully it was clear that this should be a subset of the vertices, if that induced subgraph has no edges. We check first that this really is a simplicial complex. And in order to do that, we just check first what we check. The simplices are subsets of the vertex set and that they're closed undertaking subsets. And this is easy to check that if I have a subset of vertices and that vertex set has no edges. So in other words, it's an independent set then obviously the subset is also independent. There's no edges between the subset. So if I have this definition of an independence complex, we can also check now the following interesting fact, which is that this complex is isomorphic to the clique complex on the complement. Don't miss this overline here. Remember the complement graph has all the edges that are not in G. So we would take, for instance, a subset of vertices of G, and we just observe that this, for that subset, the induced subgraph on that subset of vertices is a clique, that is, it has all possible edges, if and only if X is independent in G. So this independence complex is interesting in a lot of cases where you think about the edges of the graph as representing dependencies and you would like to know about the subsets that are independent and they have this relationship and you can translate it directly into this statement about the clique complex on the complement graph.